Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of What's Really Happening. I'm Dr. Tad Schnaufer, the Strategy and Research Manager here at the Global and National Security Institute at the University of South Florida. As always, I'm joined by GNSI's Executive Director, retired Marine Corps General Frank McKenzie, as we discuss global and national security issues. Today on this special edition of What's Really Happening, we're going to discuss General McKenzie's recently published book, The Melting Point, High Command and War in the 21st Century. Good morning, General. Welcome back. Great to be with you again, Tad. So it's, we're, we're excited about the special episode. We're going to talk about your book, The Melting Point, High Command and War in the 21st Century. So excellent book, really an easy read, but it really connects the policy to the execution on the ground. And I don't think a lot of books are able to do that, where you have these memoirs of people on the ground, you know, fighting their individual fights, and then you have higher leaders thinking this kind of pulls where policy gets to uh, on the ground. And any student foreign policy or security studies should definitely take a look at it. Throughout the book, you talk about three key threads that carry, carry us from the beginning to the end here. Uh, first one is about the importance of individual commanders and leadership styles. Uh, that second thread covers the relationship between civilian leadership and military leadership, commonly referred to as civil relations. And finally, you discuss the un unique role of a combatant commander. And of course, you were the commander for U.S. Central Command from 2019 to 2022 and held that position. But before we get into those threads, I want to kind of start at the beginning. You start the book off talking about um, reasons for that. And I'd like to get into what was the impetus behind writing this book? Well, Ted, I've always enjoyed writing. Uh, it comes to me easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt uh, that I'd occupied a unique place at a unique time in the history of our country. And uh, so the title, if I could take just a minute sure, to explain please, the title. Yeah. So the title of the book is, of course, The Melting Point. Mm -hmm. And that's taken from that excellent book by Barbara Tuchman, The Guns of August, which talks about how the nations of Europe entered the First World War in the spring, summer, and early fall of 1914. Mm -hmm. And they sort of stumbled into war. And that's a book I'd recommend that any, anyone should read. It's still in print and still very accessible out there. But in her book, she has a line, that melting point of warfare, the temperament of the individual commander. Right. And so that was sort of a genesis for me. I toted mm -hmm. that line around for a long time, wanting to use it somewhere. And, uh, and, and I was a commander, a combatant right. commander under our system, which goes back to a point you made just a few moments ago. But in the United States, the combatant commander has only two bosses, the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. And you have an opportunity to participate as a junior partner in policy debates. So you have an access to policy. At the same time, you're in the chain of command. You're the person who executes those, right. those decisions. Once the debates are finished, once the president makes a decision or the secretary, you're the person who goes out and gives orders to the force to carry those policy decisions into reality on the battlefield. And that's a unique place. A lot of people give policy advice. Right. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff gives policy advice, but he is not, he or she, not responsible for execution mm -hmm. uh, because the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is not in the chain of command. The Joint Chiefs are not in the chain of command. They give policy advice. And there are lots of people who execute policy, but only the combatant commander is at that divide where you get to participate, get to see policy made, and then you're responsible for execution. So I felt it was important to really sort of describe that process mm -hmm. during three years where a lot of things happened. And I was not a I was not an observer. I was a participant in those decisions. Right. And, and to get there was a long, distinguished career starting at the Citadel. And you start the book at the Citadel. You talk about being there at the graduation and you talk about um, leaders that you saw there, how they developed. And also you dedicate the book to two Citadel grads. I wonder if you could talk about the lessons you learned and how you kind of carry those throughout your career up to combatant command. Sure. So the Citadel uh, was, a, was a great experience for me. It probably gave me the lifetime uh, structure mm -hmm. that I carried with me until the day I left the U.S. military and, in fact, is with me today. I'm still very close with a lot of my classmates in the class of 79. Uh, it, it, you, you learned a lot of basic principles there, integrity, honor, uh, the fact that you're in part of a large organization. And if you're in charge, you need to know the people that are under you. You need to be responsible for them. It was a great opportunity to sort of learn those lessons in a laboratory on the banks of the Ashley River. And uh, those things carried really through with me for the rest of my life. And you're right. I, I started the book in uh, uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. 40th year of our uh, graduation from mm -hmm. the Citadel. And I was back at the Citadel to speak to the, the graduating class of 2019. And that was a weekend really when Iran started to act up in the region right. and uh, interrupted my visit, I actually cut our visit a little short as a result of that. But it was just an, an interesting way to sort of start the tale. Right, kind of, and it kind of ties it together. And you go into later on talking about your, your uh, relationship with Afghanistan, being there at 9-11 and then going all the way through in the end, it kind of ties it back 
But you know, touching on the leadership a little bit more, and again, you talk about knowing your subordinates. As a combatant commander, what were the qualities you were looking for in your in your leaders? So you, you just talked about some of the ones you learned from the Citadel, but you know, uh, you quote Clausewitz saying that habits breeds that uh, priceless virtue, calm. And that's one that that's one thing that you noted with many of your commanders you worked with that they were calm under pressure. You have to be calm because everyone's looking at you. So uh, there's another phrase that I really like, and mm-hmm. I, I wasn't smart enough to think this up, as with most leadership concepts, they're, they're long before us. Very sure. little is invented today that hasn't been tried and tested before. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a quote from um, Field Marshal Slim, mm-hmm. a British general and field marshal, I think one of the great under, uh, understudied officers of the Second World War. He said, the key to effective leadership is the ability to communicate energy mm-hmm. with affection. And I think it's very important because as a commander, you have to communicate energy. You have sure. to be able to convince people to do things, some of the things they're not going to want to do because they place they or their organizations at risk. Right. And you, you've got to be able to do that. At the same time, you need to maintain that relationship because you're going to have to ask them to do it maybe the day after and the day after and the day after. So you want to do it in a way where the subordinate feels he's had an opportunity to be heard. He or she has had an opportunity to be heard. You have taken their uh you know, their ideas into account as you made your decision. We all know who makes the final decision. That's right. not a, we don't need to debate that. But everyone needs to feel a little bit of buy-in into that decision. And I think it's particularly important in the U.S. military. Uh, the U.S. fighting man and fighting woman want to be part of the decision. They sure. want to feel, they, we, we're not good at actually giving blank directive orders to people. Uh, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine guardsmen, aren't good at receiving orders like that. They want to know why. They want to understand it. And a commander has to recognize that. So not only do you give orders, you need to be able to explain your orders. You need to understand, and people that are carrying out those orders need to feel that they have an understanding of why you're giving it. And those are very important things. And we're unique maybe in the United States, just a few other Western nations that actually have that approach. I believe it served us well for many years and will continue to do so. So it's really, so it's being calm, deliberate, and then it sounds like communication's critical, being able to pass the message. Communications is absolutely critical. You've Mm -hmm. got got to be able to communicate all the time at different levels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you communicate when you talk to an infantry battalion of 900 people standing in a square is very different when you sit down at a table with nine three-star generals and communicate the same plan to them. So you, but it is the same plan ultimately, Mm -hmm. but it's a different audience and you need to tailor the message to those audiences. Right, because you talk about uh, what you expected of your nine commanders, that you expected from them context. Well, you might, in your command, you might actually go to specific subject matter experts as well and pull in a junior officer for their input. So could you explain kind of how you came about that process? Sure. So when I was um, the J-5, the, the strategic planner mm-hmm. for General Jim Mattis at Central Command, 2010 to 2012, I was a one then a two-star general. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, General Mattis would reach down in my organization and pull a lieutenant colonel or a mm-hmm. colonel up to see him. To ask a very specific question that used to, I used to irritate me because I was the J five. He should have come to me. Mm-hmm. Well, as I became the CENTCOM commander uh, nine years later, sure. I often did the same thing. And the reason I did it was this: first of all, that that lieutenant colonel colonel has a very discreet set of knowledge that that I don't necessarily expect my two star general or admiral to have because the general or admiral uh, balances a much larger portfolio. So it's good for that young officer to have an interaction with a commander, good for him, good for me to get that information directly. What I expect from my flag officers, though, is context. The key thing that a commander has got to be able to do at any level is you have to see the pattern. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the pattern. So that means you need to set up a process for deciding what is the pattern you're looking at, how is the pattern changing or not changing, and what does it mean? Good commanders can do that. Uh, it's really, and, and some of it you can teach. Some of it, some of it is uh, what's been called the Kingfisher Flash. Ninety percent yeah. is knowable, ten percent is not knowable, and it comes down to the personality of the leader. And you talked about this in the human element of leaders in command. Could you go into that a little bit more? That element that's beyond just what you can be taught. Uh, human element is very important, and uh, and and so uh, here's the when I had to make difficult decisions at Central Command, mm-hmm. uh, the model I used was this, and again, this is not mine originally. Sure. But we all know uh, the typical military model is it's a big pyramid. Mm-hmm. At the top is the man or woman who commands the organization. Mm-hmm. The next level down, there are more people, more people, more people at each level. So finally, you get down to the people that are in contact with the enemy, mm-hmm. more of them than, than anything else. So I found it was useful in my own mind to turn that over. Okay. Because at the CENTCOM commander level, there's no shortage of people to give you advice. Mm-hmm. So it's actually a very broad platform. But as you get closer and closer to contact with the enemy, 
there are fewer and fewer people. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you get down to the man or woman who's in contact, and they're alone. The battlefield's been called a very lonely place, and it is, whether you're in a in an airplane, a single seat or a multi-crewed airplane, where, whether you're in a submarine in a fighting position, ultimately it's the individual. And as you make decisions at a very high level that impact that individual, you need to bear that in mind. Sure. And I found that was a very humbling and humanizing thing for me to consider as I made decisions, some of which put that single person in contact with the enemy in grave risk. Right, and you know, going back to the top of that pyramid, think about the commander, you talk about introspective. You talk about being in the White House, having some time to think, and that senior leaders, you know, they might not, they take that time to really think about their, their ways going forward, but they're not taking too much time necessarily to reflect. You have to be secure in your decision-making capabilities. You absolutely do, Ted. And it, so as you plan, you have time. Mm -hmm. In execution, time, you don't have time. Right. You know, and that's the one variable that you can't construct more of. You mm -hmm. can't transmute it. Uh, either you got time or you don't. And usually in execution, there's not enough of it. Sure, sure. And actually reading that reminded me of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's concept of the crowded hour when he's charging San Juan Hill, this idea that all of a sudden time compresses into that, those moments of action. It gets very compressed when you, get into, when you get into a combat situation. Sure, sure. And speaking of sending people in there and the importance of individual commanders, uh, the combatant, as you know, as the combatant commander, you say, quote, you know, stands astride the boundary of decision-making and execution. So can you describe a little bit more in depth on what does that look like? You're getting orders from the Secretary of Defense and then transmitting that to your force. Sure. So as we were talking just a few minutes, mm -hmm. minutes ago about that, Tad, it is a unique position right? in that you are in the councils of policy debate, not always, but mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, but when you're in there, you're a junior partner. You're not making decisions. Right. The decisions are being made by civilian leadership. But you have an opportunity to give advice. You have an opportunity to hear those debates. You have an opportunity to shape opinions in there. So you work very hard to be prepared to do that, and then you do that. Right. But you walk out of that meeting, you walk out of that conference, and you're going to get an order. It's going to be from the president to the secretary to you, and then you're going to be responsible for execution. And that's a unique thing. And what you have to do then is the order is going to come down. You're going to have to, in your own mind, internalize it, make it yours, and then issue it to your force, to those uh, people under you in the chain of command, who expect you to give them an order with, a, with an opportunity to accomplish the mission and to come back alive. That's difficult to do sometimes. Right. And so that's what a combatant commander does. That unique spot in the transmission of the order mm -hmm. from policy debate into actionable military order uh, to go down to forces that are actually, that are gonna uh, take charge and carry out the, uh, the dictates of national mm -hmm. policy. And this is a very dynamic, complex web of decision-making you know, criteria because you're also thinking kind of a two-level game, that's what I said. You're thinking about domestic implications, foreign uh, implications, what are allies going to think, what's the adversary going to do? How do you, how do you wrap your mind around all those different... So with the highest levels, uh, the President of the United States and his advisors, they make decisions based on a variety of things, and mm -hmm. certainly internal political uh, calculation sure. is part of that. Anyone who thinks that's not the case is, 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 is wrong. And the broad sweep of American history certainly justifies that observation. Now, the combatant commander, I have no opinion of that. That's sure. not my right. area of expertise. But you just need to recognize that presidents have a very broad view and they will make decisions based on a variety of factors. Mm -hmm. One of which are the military factors, mm -hmm. the other of which may be other, other things that are not immediately available or mm -hmm. uh, accessible or visible to the combatant commander. You just need to recognize that. President's decision is properly his or her decision, and when it comes down, they have every right to expect those orders to be executed. Right, because because you mentioned even a couple times where you you saw the impact of elections having on, whether on U.S. decisions or maybe even Iranian decisions. You you know about uh, the Iranians choosing to release hostages right after the 1980 right. election and kind of showing that uh, Jimmy Carter, you know, kind of giving him an embarrassing moment for his administration. So how does that play in the calculus? Obviously, we're on the military side here. But can you see that uh, through that divide? Absolutely. And, and you see it in policy debates. You see it in decisions that are made. And to, 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 to believe that that's not the case, that those factors don't influence decisions, is to take a simplistic view of what's actually going on. My job, though, as a combatant commander mm -hmm. is to articulate the military options, sure. to talk about the risks that attend those military options. But I'll tell you one thing. When we talk about risk and I present risk, the phrase sure. I never use is I never say this is unacceptable risk. Right. Because ultimately, that's a political mm -hmm. policy calculation, not a military calculation. I may present a plan. I may think the risk is too high. Right. Well, I'll, I'll articulate that. I'll say what the risk is. And we try to take the emotion out of it by not using the phrase very high, very, very high mm -hmm. risk, in the, you know, which we often fall back on the stoplight colored chart 
better to say, if we do this, if we execute this plan, we may place an aircraft carrier at grave hazard of being lost. Sure. Okay. That may be something I'm, I think is very high risk inside Central Command. But from the perspective of the President of the United States, who has a global view, mm -hmm. that may be a risk he or she's willing to bear. And you, just, you have to recognize that difference of approach uh, if you're going to be effective in those debates. Right, right, and you and you go into a great uh, breakdown of if a commander says that the end state cannot be reached to civilian leadership. Civilian leadership, you note, I'm paraphrasing, have three uh, three things that they can do. They can either change the objective right. to make it achievable. They can give you more resources as a combatant commander to make it achievable, or they can tell you just the additional forces aren't available and you're going to have to execute. That's right, and that how that often happens. Right. And then, but, that, but at that point, then the secretary or the president they own that risk. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, look, I'm still the person out there executing sure. it, and there are mm -hmm. soldier, sailors, airmen, Marines, and others that are out there that are going to be in harm's way. And we all know and understand that. But, but the, the possibility of, uh, of, of bad events happening has been exposed to polit policy leadership. They made a decision. Now we're going to go execute it. Right, right. And then again, like you said, your job with that civil relations piece, the civilians have the final say for that. For that have to have the final say. Right. Any, other, uh, any other approach, any approach where we allow any general at any level mm -hmm. to have a veto power over lawful orders issued by the president is a course of action that would be disastrous for the future of the republic. Is that because of the tradition we have here in the United States? I think our powerful uh, tradition of military subordinate mm -hmm. to civilian leadership is one of the unique and compelling things about this, this nation of ours, and it's important that it be continued. And here's the thing. Elected leaders, the president, mm -hmm. has the right to make a wrong decision. Sure. And they have every right to expect that wrong decision to be executed by the U.S. military as so long as the order is legal. A legal order is pretty clear to understand. Legal order is right. very clear. At Central Command, I had no shortage of lawyers mm -hmm. who could give me advice on what a legal order was. Um, they didn't have to do that because I knew what a legal order was. And I've in 42 years and 10 months of service, I've never received an illegal order. Right. And speaking of order, you know, there's other things that come from up uh, from above. You know, strategic documents, planning guidance. Throughout the melting point, you note a couple times that it was hard necessarily to get maybe the overall strategic guidance for an operation, or maybe the political objective wasn't clear as you talk about the overall campaign for Afghanistan, for example. It is, it, you know, as you, it, you, you'd hope your strategic guidance comports to realities on the ground. Right. And if it doesn't, you need to change your strategic guidance. Well, often realities on the ground change far more rapidly right. yeah. than our decision-making process can adjust strategy guidance. And so, yeah, pretty much the realities outpace the plan, and so you have to be able to adapt on the fly. You do, and our ability to do that often uh, often lags. Right, because you mentioned uh, when you got back from a deployment to Afghanistan, you said you learned three big, or you had three big observations. That uh, one, and I'm paraphrasing here, one that we as the U.S. was as much a part of the problem as the Taliban. That civ mill teams broke down, and the importance of Pakistan to the Taliban. And you said this earlier on. And so, how can those things? Uh, what what is the um, issues with those three kind of components going forward? Throughout the Afghanistan campaign. Well, sure. So, in the case of uh, the case of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the fact that we were never able to cut off uh, Taliban sanctuary in Pakistan mm -hmm. really obviated most of our other planning, sure. yeah. uh, most of our other capabilities. I mean, our own doctrine says, our own counterinsurgency doctrine says, you can't have an offshore sanctuary if you expect sure. to win the campaign. Well, we always had one, and we were never able to marshal enough uh, will to cause mm -hmm. Pakistan to stop their support because Pakistan always believed we were going to leave, right. that we yeah. would eventually depart. And of course, in the final analysis, the Pakistanis were right and we were wrong. We left. Mm -hmm. And you draw parallels to Vietnam a number of times throughout the, throughout the book. And I thought this was one too, is where in Vietnam, we had Laos and Cambodia, right. we had these other sanctuaries. Right. And so the same, it's going with that Vietnam example, what, what, what was the issue with learning from our past conflicts and bringing them forward yeah. with us? Is it a generation gap? Is it what, what happened? I think the, think? The, the United States has trouble learning lessons from our, even our own past. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think okay. it may be because mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're a republic, mm -hmm. have elected, uh, elected officials, it's cyclical. Uh, sometimes the institutions can draw lessons, but the institutions aren't actually in charge when it comes to this. It's political leadership, and political right. leadership can be short or long, have a short or long-term view, not unique to any party sure. particularly. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard sometimes for us to avoid repeating mistakes we've made in the past, even if we recognize those mistakes. Right. It's just kind of the momentum of the situation pulls us in. You're absolutely right.
because uh, you mentioned the incremental, incremental approach to Afghanistan, kind of slowly, like we were in, but we weren't all the way in, I believe uh, you said in the book. And we have that same scenario in Vietnam, the slow uptick in the early 1960s, mid 1960s, going all in with air campaigns and then you know, eventually 500,000 troops. And similarly in Afghanistan, we start small, we keep increasing, then we have our surge and then the slow downtick on the outside. Is this in parallel? Sometimes it's a, uh, now this is not a military problem, I would right. argue. This is a national level problem. Sure. You want to treat you want to treat these wars like it's a business case study, Interesting. when in fact it's a conflict of naked human will, right? And right. it doesn't admit itself of an incremental approach or a tidy, cerebral, detached, cool mm -hmm. ap approach. You have to recognize that real people are fighting and dying, and uh, and so you can't turn the knob up and down a little bit, <laughs> right. as yeah. we try to do in Vietnam, and frankly, as we try to do in Afghanistan as well. And you need to recognize also, and this is the lesson we didn't learn in Vietnam, and I don't think we learned it actually in Afghanistan. Hopefully we've learned it in Afghanistan, that the laws of history even operate against the United States. Right. That we are not immune to those. And, uh, and there are limits to our practical power. Look, sure. in the case of Afghanistan, I would argue Afghanistan is not ungovernable. Mm -hmm. It is ungovernable from a Western model. Sure. And we never rec we never chose to recognize that. We continued to believe that we just put more resources in there. We just put more troops in there albeit with a timeline, mm -hmm. uh, that we could solve the problem. Well, the problem is not solvable under those terms. It is solvable, it's just not solvable under those terms. Sure, and I was wondering, uh, what, what terms would they be solvable under, being able to use the um, domestic Afghanistan kind of governance that we, we came into in 2001? How do you think that would well, work so out? Well, I, I think in Afghanistan, we went in there to prevent attacks being developed against sure. the United States. Had we kept to that rubric, mm -hmm. then we would have had a very different path in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the former government we established as a result of the Bonn Agreement. Mm -hmm. We had an opportunity to either crush the Taliban completely or co-opt them into the government in 2002, 2003 sure. or so. We chose not to do that. The decision to invade Iraq uh, mm -hmm. took our focus off Afghanistan and didn't return it till it was far too late and things had gotten out of hand. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we pushed billions and billions of dollars into the country to try to eventually recast it as not a Western state, but a, a state that uh, could not grow in the soil of Central Asia. <laughs> Fair enough. And so a lot of things we drifted because we, because we were looking elsewhere. We were looking at Iraq for a long time mm -hmm. and we sort of took our eye off the ball there. And then because of that, we ended up having to go back to it in a sense. We did, only yeah. it was probably too late at that point. And you, talk, very, you know, that's all very clear now, Ted. It was not clear at the time. Sure. And, you know, obviously, we're, we're talking with the, you know, 2020 hindsight here. But it's interesting about trying to get those lessons learned, though, trying to carry them forward. What can we learn from yeah. these uh, actions? And you, you talk about in the book, again, that you have, um, you know, you had three memorable moments in your life, the assassination of JFK, 9-11, and, and the time you got the order to withdraw from Afghanistan. So two of those directly involve Afghanistan. They do. Those three events. Could you talk about those last two a little bit more in depth for us? And we've already talked about your, some of your experience there, but maybe. Sure. So for, for me, 9-11, um, uh, I was in the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I was a, uh, a young Marine colonel, a frocked colonel, as we would say, mm -hmm. wasn't even drawing colonel's pay. Oh, wow. I was still okay. technically a lieutenant colonel, but was mm -hmm. wearing eagles. And I was the executive assistant to a, a, a great Marine, a guy named Lieutenant General Buck Bedard, mm -hmm. who was the operations deputy of the Marine Corps. And we were preparing him for a trip to Mexico. And we had, we had uh, because we were the Marine Corps, we had the least desirable series of offices in the building mm -hmm. up on the fifth deck, A ring, which is all the way in overlooking the courtyard, low, old, unreconstructed offices. Oh, wow. We were briefing him and uh, first airplane hit the building. And, and so the military secretary to the commandant called me. I said, okay, what? Right. I knew that uh, in the, right at the end of World War II, an airplane had flown to the Empire State mm -hmm, Building, right. B-25 or B-26. So I, I knew there was history for this. So it didn't mm -hmm. strike me one thing or another. And then we go back into the briefing with General Bedard, and then our political advisor, State Department official, mm -hmm. ran to the room and shouted, another airplane hit the building. So General Bedard looked at me and said, and I could tell from the look, go investigate, including mm -hmm. the possibility that the political advisor went nuts. Right, so, exactly. So, yeah. so I went out determined that, no, we were probably in a very bad situation. Got General Bedard out of the meeting. We're talking to my good friend who ran the Marine Corps Operations Center, mm -hmm. which was not in the Pentagon, up at the old Navy Annex on a hill overlooking the Pentagon. And the, he called us and said, hey, there's an airplane inbound to the building. It's going to hit in about another minute or two. They're launching fighters. They're not going to catch it. Wow. So right about then, the airplane hit the building. And it was a big boom. Didn't knock us down or anything. But it's clearly we knew what it was. We ran out across our offices and looked across the courtyard. You could see the huge fireball coming up from the, from the strike. 
And we stayed in the building then for about another three hours because our comms were still working, our computers were up, mm -hmm. and General Bedard was talking to the Marine Corps. The commandant was trapped across the river at a funeral. Mm -hmm. And of course, traffic went crazy in Washington then. Yeah. Took him a long time to get back. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, General Bedard was sort of calming everybody down. We're talking to the commandant. And then we eventually displace and go up to our operations center. And the Navy fell in on us because tragically, as you know, Tad, the Navy's operations center was destroyed in the attack and many, mm -hmm. many sailors died as a result of that. So they fell in on us at our offsite operations center up at, up at uh, what we call Henderson Hall, which right. is where our, our headquarters was. And we operated out of there for several months. So that was really my introduction to 9-11. It was wow. a life-changing event for me. Uh, changed everything that happened to me afterward, you know, for the remainder of my career. It, mm -hmm. it was very, it, everything was, was very different as a result of that. And so you, you talked a little bit about getting the word to come out of Afghanistan. We were, uh, I was actually, mid, it was middle of April 2021, flying up to D.C. to run a course uh, for three-star officers mm -hmm. who could become four-star officers. And so we were, a week gives them exposure to a, to a four-star general, sitting on the runway over here at Tampa, mm -hmm. and the secretary called and conveyed the decision of the president. I did, I'll never forget it. I mean, it was very clear guidance. I understood it. Um, and that from that, really, sort of the last chapter in Afghanistan began. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, culminated in the events of August 2021. I wish we had charted a different course that brought us to that decision. It was not the decision I had hoped for, but civilian leadership right. got to make the decision. I had had the opportunity to give advice. I know that advice was heard. It wasn't taken, which is fine. Um, but, though, but that sort of set in train the motion that ended in the tragic events of, August, of August 2021. And I'm sure there's some memorable events of the withdrawal. There's some moments that you really had to think about, you know, the next steps and how you're going to execute or where there's a pretty streamlined on how you're going to carry out those orders. Well, so um, actually, um, it was, we had, we had done a lot of planning for this. Sure. Yeah. So we, we had a good plan. Uh, the problem with our withdrawal from Afghanistan, Tad, was that actually, when we made the decision to come out in April, mm -hmm. we did not make a decision at that time to bring out our embassy, yeah. our citizens, or our at-risk Afghans. That was a structural flaw in the decision mm -hmm. that led directly to what happened in, in August. Had we begun to bring out those three entities then, we would have been a, in a very different place in high summer uh, 2021 yeah. when the wheels really came off the wagon. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue that had we begun to bring out our people in April when we brought out our military, we might have hastened the fall of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's possible. We don't know. Sure. It's a counterfactual. Right. Uh, yeah. We do know the factual answer, though. We did not do it. And as a result, we had a disaster uh, in August when we did not actually declare an evacuation until the 14th of August. Right. We had brought out all our forces and capped that exercise on 12 July mm -hmm. when General Scott Miller came out of Afghanistan. I relieved him as the last commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. So we had a structural flaw in that decision to, to come out which actually directly led to the events of August. Right, and you talk about in the melting point, they kind of build up the branch plans. You had different plans based off of different scenarios. And of course, the decision is a very complex one because the ambassador doesn't necessarily want to leave. Right. There's all these other uh, agencies. Ted, no no, no ambassador wants to declare a NEO, a non-combatant evacuation right. operation, because it's an admission of failure. Right. And I've been around a lot of ambassadors and a lot of NEO situations, nobody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm very acutely sympathetic to the, to the, sure. to the desire of the Department of State to maintain a diplomatic outpost in Kabul. However, I go back to a point I made earlier, the laws of history operate even <laughs> against right. us. And if you retreat, if you leave, you don't necessarily get to dictate the terms of the game anymore. Right. We, had tr we have trouble digesting that. Sure, because you, know, you want to, like you say, you know, want to think that the U.S. can pull it off. You want it all. Right. You want out, yet you still want to dictate policy. You actually can't do that anymore, Tad. You're right. out. So as a commander, as that as the month of August, you know, going back to Barbara Tuckman's, I guess in this case, a different August, August of twenty one. What was your feeling as the month progressed? Because you said originally, you know, you thought the Afghan government might be able to hold on for a little while, maybe even survive the fighting season. How does that progress as you get closer to the actual? Well, government? I felt that, and I said as early as twenty twenty, actually, mm -hmm. fall of twenty twenty, that if we withdrew all our forces, the governor of Afghanistan would fall. Mm -hmm. It was just a question of when that was going to be. Sure, how long? And by the early summer, midsummer of twenty twenty one. I had sort of had two views. One view was the positive view, the hopeful view, would be that they would ride out the Taliban offensive in the late summer of 2021, go into the fall, holding on to what we call the Kabul Bowl, the approaches sure. to Kabul, maybe a capital or two, get into winter, get into the end of the fighting season, 
weather would slow everything down, that in the spring the Taliban would probably roll over the country. Mm -hmm. That was the optimistic scenario. Yeah. The pessimistic scenario was they're going to roll them all over here in the late fall. I didn't think it would be mid-August. I thought it might be another month. Mm -hmm. But as we every day, that timeline collapsed even more as we saw yeah. what the Taliban were actually doing. Wow, yeah, and they were having unprecedented successes. Unprecedented success, very different than when they took over the country in the 90s, mm -hmm. in that this was a state collapse. Right. right. Not necessarily a military collapse. It was a state collapse of which the military collapse was simply a component. And it was brought about the proximate cause of that was the Doha Agreement mm -hmm. and our inability to force the Taliban to adhere to the conditions they set for themselves under the Doha Agreement. We did what we said we would do under the Doha Agreement which is principally withdrawal on a schedule. The Taliban were, in, were uh, obligated to do a number of things. They did none of those things. With one exception, they stopped attacking us. Right. They redoubled their attacks on the Afghans, but they stopped attacking us. Right, and apparently that strategy was, in a sense, to keep us from coming back in and using force, you think? It was, a, it was a clever strategy by the Taliban. At a higher level, Tad, I tell you that the events of uh, August 2021 or the direct result of two presidential administrations, as mm -hmm. unlike as any two in modern <laughs> right. American history, who nonetheless shared a single continuity uh, of objective in Afghanistan, to get out regardless of the consequences. Sure. The Doha Agreement negotiated under the Trump administration and the final execution under the Biden administration, probably the only area there was any policy continuity mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and that's what led to what happened in August. And how do you communicate? You, you talk multiple times throughout the melting point through the different operations you mentioned, again, the strike on Soleimani, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, about working with allies and trying to communicate with them. So could you touch a little bit on like what our allies are doing during these times and how you, how you work with sure. them on the ground? So if you're going to command Central Command and work in the Middle East, you're going to work within some form of a collective security architecture sure. or an alliance structure or very close friends that have share the same interests that you do. So you have to talk to your allies all the time mm -hmm. and your friends. You're not quite allies, but very close friends all the time. It's a constant uh, process if you're the central command commander because you need what we call access basing and overflight. Mm -hmm. Th or those are countries that if we're going to fly over them, take off from them, mm -hmm. uh, do work in those countries, we have to have their willing uh, compliance with our policy goals. That's a full-time job. Uh, just working with the with the friends in the region, mm -hmm. so I spent a lot of time doing that. And I, I, but moreover, I actually believe that the United States is better when we operate within some form of a collective security architecture. Sure. NATO is the classic example. There are other examples. We don't have NATO in the Middle East, and probably never will. But nonetheless, we have friends there that share our views, and even if they don't all share our values, sometimes if you're going to be a global power, you have to do business with people who share your interests. Sure. Sure. And there's a old quote by um, a prime minister, uh, Paul Mason from England, that our interests are, in, I'm paraphrasing, the interests are internal, but your friends are not. That is correct. That's and a great, that's a great quote. You have to follow the interests. Someone who understood that problem very clearly. Yes, indeed. And so w working with allies, and again, so we just talked a lot about Afghanistan and that history you had there, but we're also, there's a lot of other things going on throughout Central Command during that period. And one of them is obviously trying to deter Iran. So you have this issue with Afghanistan working that. We have troops in Iraq. So could you give us a basis of, in the book you touch on, obviously the strike on Soleimani and what that did for um, deterrence to Iran? The Iranians have, have a very clear understanding of our capabilities. Mm -hmm. They know what we bring to the fight. They know what we can turn on them if we engage in a major war with them. They always doubt our will, right. our ability to actually apply those capabilities. So what the Soleimani strike did was it required them to recalculate mm -hmm. our will because it took them by surprise. And they have, they and they are still digesting it. I would argue, uh, Tad, even to this day. Wow! And that's had an effect on their thinking. So, if you're going to try to establish deterrence with an opponent, the way you want to do it is, you can do it a couple of ways. You can do it by denial. Mm. You can't attain your objective, or you can say, "Oh, we're going to punish you if you do uh, uh, achieve your objective." It won't be worth the cost to you of achieving that objective. Right. So we go back and forth about those two approaches in the region. But in, in all times, what you're trying to do is establish a doubt in the cognitive space of the opponent, the mind of the opponent, mm -hmm. that what they want and what Iran wants is three things. They want to protect their government right. yeah. because it's a revolutionary government. It's, it, they view it as fragile. They want it to, they, that's the number one priority. Number two priority is destruction of the state of Israel. Number three priority is the ejection of the United States from the region. Objectives two and three might flip-flop. Three might become two, two might become three, but nothing ever touches objective one. Sure. 
which is self-preservation of the regime. That's, that's the absolute most important thing to Iran. So if you understand that, then you can actually see why the Iranians behave in the way that they do. And you can also see that there are ways to gain leverage against Iran. Typically, it's by display of force and will. Sure. They respect that. They don't respect weakness. They don't respect, it's, it's the old Lenin phrase, stick a bayonet in. If, you, mm -hmm. if, you, if it meets mush, continue pushing it. Mm -hmm. If you reach still, pull it out. Iranians respect steel, and that's the way you got to show them. That's the way you establish a pattern of deterrence with Iran. It seems like most countries would respect steel. It's probably the Russians and everyone else would expect power is pretty, you know, the end all currency in many ways. As a general principle, I think it's, it's, it has right. great utility. Of course, when you're dealing with a nuclear armed power, it's something completely different. Mm -hmm. yes, and so yeah. you've got to be a little more cautious with Russia than you do with Iran. That's an interesting point. And one of the other threads, we talked about the importance of individual key leaders and striking Soleimani just as key leader of the Quds force. We can talk a little bit about what, what does that mean overall for the region, but this key leader, um, and you quote the foreign minister of Iran saying that that strike in, in uh, taking Soleimani off the battlefield was a major blow to Iran. So can you talk about how one individual affects the battlefield in this case? Well, so leaders are important. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes we're in an era where uh, individuals are devalued. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. certainly Marxist historians would tell you structural forces that determine everything, great right. patterns that, you know, that where <laughs> individuals don't really count much. I think that's a false view. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that everything, I'm not saying I'm a complete believer in the great man right. theory of history, yeah. but the fact of the matter is key people at key places at key times can make significant decisions. The United States was blessed with Franklin Delano Roosevelt in mm -hmm. the Second World War. Without any military background, he was the right guy at the right time to bring the nation through the war. I might agree or disagree with him on certain other of his policies, but actually as a uh, global strategist, he was, uh, he was preeminent in the Second World War. So people matter. Commanders matter because at a lower level, they're not global strategists, but they are strategists, and they're responsible for executing those tasks that are made, that are decided by political leadership. The individuals matter, and, uh, and individual combat leaders are very significant, I would argue. Right, right, and they have huge impacts. And you talk about um, how each president, you know, speaking of individual personalities and how they address uh, national security issues, you talk about how each president uh, gets, eventually gets the national security process that they want. And you're kind of talking about the differences between Obama, uh, Trump, and Biden. Can you talk a little bit about what that national security process looks like from your time on the Joint Staff and then as a combatant commander? Sure, so, uh, so Ted, the national security process is really what the people around the president that inform how he's gonna make decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's several different entities. It is the National Security Staff first, right. which is in the White House, run by the APNSA, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. Not a confirmed position. Mm -hmm. Important to note that. So you don't have to go through the Senate to get that job. But it's a very important job. And there are a lot of different ways to run it. You can view it as someone who coordinates the actions of the cabinet agencies, state, defense, others. Or you can view it as an agency that's actually going to become operational. Mm -hmm. Many of these national security staffs, different administrations at different times, have found it impossible to uh, avoid succumbing to the temptation to become operational hmm, and to direct, yeah, right. and to direct uh, operations from the White House. Generally speaking, that's not good for operations. It's right. not good for the nation, but it's a, hard, uh, it's a hard temptation to resist. Right, particularly with new technology where you can really reach down to the tactical level at any time. The illusion of, the illusion of control. Right. Uh, is profound. Uh, and so you believe, well, if we just get perfect information here, we can make perfect decisions. Right. Of course, human beings are in these decisions. Human beings are on the ground. Uh, it's difficult to do that. It's a lot easier to think about than it is to actually execute effectively over time. Right. But that's part of that civil military um, relation piece that's important for the government to have that discussion, to have that ongoing kind of... It is. But, but again, uh, Ted, I would, I would point out Civilian leadership gets to make that decision. Right, in the end. In the end, they get to make that decision. The degree to which they want to have uh, you know, military people give them advice is a decision that, they, that every president approaches a little bit differently. Every national security staff approaches a little bit differently. And every secretary of defense approaches a little bit differently. Excellent, excellent. And then to kind of zoom back to the region and cover some more uh, topics you touched in the, uh, the melting point, you talk about the Russians a couple of times and their, their, their work in... Uh, Syria, particularly with uh, some of the operations uh, in the Euphrates River Valley. You could kind of touch on what Wagner Group was doing there a few years ago and then kind of sure. how, the, how the Russians have played that card. So the Russians entered Syria not because they're brilliant chess players that see seven moves ahead, <laughs> but because Vladimir Putin is intensely opportunistic. Sure. And he saw an opportunity to come into Syria in the early, in the early 2000 teens 
in order to support one of the few regimes in the world that he has a relationship with. Right. You have opportunity to have a warm water port in the Eastern Mediterranean, which was mm -hmm. a long-term objective of Soviet strategy, in fact, Russian strategy even before that, and also to demonstrate that Russia is actually not a failing uh, economic power that's struggling to maintain a presence on the world stage, but is an equal. And it may be premise or Paris, he would say, first among equals. I yeah. don't think I'd go that far, nor right. would anyone else, but I can't, I, I can't account Their perception. for Russian thinking. And last, to throw sand in our gearbox, mm -hmm. have an opportunity to tweak the United States. All of those reasons, can tell you a little bit, and there's oil and money there. Sure. And the Russian military is completely corrupt. And so you have an opportunity for Russian leaders that go mm -hmm. in there to play off Wagner Group and others to actually siphon some of that money off for themselves and their family. Wow. It reminds me of some of Napoleon's marshals in Spain or something like that going in and doing a little bit. There of may a, be more parallels there than, uh, yeah, than are immediately evident. Wow. That's, that's really uh, fascinating stuff. But overall, the, the the interaction with the Russians is relatively minimal for the U.S. I mean, you touch on it a little bit in the book, but for the most part, no. Uh, you know, you know they, they know and respect our capabilities. The Russians right. are good at correlation of forces. They understand what would happen if mm -hmm. they got into trouble with us in the Middle East. Sure. Uh, you know, the, uh, in a couple of years before I came to CENTCOM, a, a large body of Wagner Group mercenaries tried to cross the uh, Euphrates River and, and, and attack an oil field that we were defending. We cut them up pretty bad. Mm -hmm. They've never forgotten that. Right. Well, that goes back to the deterrence piece we were talking about. It goes about. back to deterrence. You have to yeah. reset it continually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something, and that's an interesting piece about deterrence. It's often underestimated is the ma maintenance of deterrence. You have the half-life of deterrence in the Middle East is very short. Right. You got to keep reminding them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, General, you wrap up the book, The Melting Point, uh, with, you kind of talk about the responsibility after Afghanistan, and then you talk about kind of the future of the region in different aspects. Could you touch on a few of those and how, how you, how you finish? Sure. That? So I think a key, obviously we're all now watching the Gaza war, mm -hmm. uh, immense human tragedy uh, at the beginning and now going forward as well. Uh, but I think the larger, there's a larger story here. And the larger story is how nations in the region are going to react to the continued malevolent activities of Iran. Right and their ability to defend against Iran's malign activities is at the very top of their list of things to do. Sure. So that leads them to continued coordination with Israel. Mm -hmm. I think, Ted, over the long term, it's going to lead to increased normalization of ties with Israel, facilitated by the fact that now Israel is inside the Central Command region, which I think, while it appears to be a purely mil military bureaucratic thing, is actually very important for how nations coordinate with Israel going forward. And we saw a test of that recently in the Iranian attack on Israel that occurred in mid-April, mm -hmm. where nations in the region actually participated in the defense of Israel. That was a remarkable display, I think, of the way forward in the region. Do so you feel like there's a real opportunity because of the shared interest to counter this threat to actually uh, build some cohesion there? So I think interests are very important. <laughs> yes. And as we talked a little bit earlier about Lord Pal Palmerston and his yeah. comment on that, mm -hmm. uh, nations have powerful interests in protecting themselves against Iran, who actively threatens them all. Right. And so that's going to drive a community. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't believe it's going to be NATO, let me be very sure, clear. Yeah. But I think there's some things that nations can do together uh, to defend against Iran, and we're going to see that continue in the future. Well, ex excellent to have you here, General. An amazing book, a recommended read, and looking forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Ted. My pleasure. And that wraps up another episode of What's Really Happening. We had a fascinating discussion today with retired Marine Corps General Frank McKenzie about his recently published book, The Melting Point, High Command and War in the 21st Century. I'm Dr. Tad Schnaufer here with the Global and National Security Institute at the University of South Florida. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to our next conversation when we find out what's really happening.